Good. I, I want to take you back to the old world now from fascinating Queensland, uh, which is well known for, for its geomorphological features. I'll take you to Belgium. Now, um, I know there are some people from Belgium here, but those who are not, I would really wonder how many of you would associate Belgium with uh, landslide problems. Probably not very many. Uh, for me, it was quite new. So this is work that I've been doing with Meet von den Eckhout at the JRC in Ispra in Italy and uh, also John Posen and, and, and Javier Erbas. And uh, we've been, well actually Meet has been looking at, uh, at, at landslides in Belgium in the, in the Flemish Ardennes for, for many years. And um, only recently we started using LIDAR data and, and, and GeoBeer to try to see if we can identify those landslides. Now, those of you who came to, to my presentation on landslides yesterday, where I talked about object-based analysis of, of optical data in India, that tends to be relatively simple because you have these bare patches where vegetation has been removed. Um, today, we'll be talking about something entirely different. I'll take a, show you a picture already. Um, I mean, you're all fairly experienced people, I suppose, so it's not that difficult to identify the landslide, but I think you're, you're starting to appreciate the challenge when we're talking about very subdued, old, uh, anthropogenically altered and, and, and partly eroded landslides that are heavily vegetated. So optical data would stand no chance uh, to, to help us to find those. So in this presentation, I want to, I want to share some, some of our recent results using uh, uh, an e-cognition-based uh, approach, essentially, using, using LIDAR data and derivatives to, to identify these landslides in, in Belgium. Um, when, we, when we briefly look at the history of how LIDAR data have been used for, um, for landslide work, there's a whole body of, of, of literature already, uh, including studies on the identification and mapping, but also a large amount of, of, of work on characterization, monitoring, modeling, and so forth. So we are really focusing here on the left-hand side, which is the identification and mapping. And there you see that, that you can do it with an expert-based approach, but also in, in a sem semi-automatic fashion. Uh, expert base has a large amount of work. Uh, I don't want to go into this now. Um, well, Meet actually, Meet von der Eckhardt would be would be one of those, and she did she did a, a, an important study, important for for this particular piece of work uh, in the Ardennes in 2007, where she asked a number of experts to do expert based analysis of these uh, very difficult to map landslides. And what you what you're seeing here. Is, is one of those results from seven different experts. And well, first observation is there's pretty good agreement. Second observation is, well, there's also a lot of disagreement, right? So for us, that, that poses a particular problem because uh, A, what we try to do in GeoBia is really replicate what experts normally do, the kind of like quasi-cognitive process that we go through. We try to automate this. But at the same time, we tend to use an expert-based uh, inventory as a reference set for our, for our uh, validation and accuracy assessment. So here, we are really having some, some moving goalposts, which makes it very difficult later on to come up with credible uh, accuracy figures. So if you look at the at semi-automated approaches, there have been uh, a number of studies uh, doing it with, with pixel-based methods. So again, I, this is not the focus of the talk. Many of you will be familiar with these studies. So I've just uh, indicated some here. Interesting stuff, but I think we all understand and know well the limitations of pixel-based work. And when it comes to something as intricate and as hidden and as subtle, really, as these landslides, you really need to pull all the strings and bring in all your morphological uh, knowledge here, your process knowledge, uh, knowledge of spatial association, etc. So which pixels simply cannot provide. Yeah, I mean, pixels are great to look for discontinuities in terrain, to look for abrupt changes and so forth. But when it comes to really creating a holistic understanding of a, of a, of a body, in this case a landslide, um, I, would, uh, I would hope that you agree that we need some kind of uh, object-based uh, approach. Now, there, there, have been, there have been studies um, that have been quite influential for us, both at a local and also at a regional scale, uh, using LIDAR data. So, for example, here in the, in the US, you see these, you probably know these studies from Glenn and also from, from Booth et al. And they're, they're quite nice, and they identify regions um, where failure does occur or can occur. But it's not so much an, a characterization or delineation of individual landslides. And in particular, the study on the right by, by, by Booth for me, it always seems a little bit 
while I've always had some doubts about it because ultimately the entire coastline is mapped as, as, as being susceptible, which is true, but also to me, I always have the impression that it is relatively straightforward because the entire area is essentially uh, yeah, sub, uh, yeah, susceptible to, to, to failure there. So what we want to do is uh, sort of like build on this work that I also presented yesterday by, by Marta et al, where we, where we use elevation data and a, and a conceptualization of a, of a landslide. But what previous work has done is use elevation information uh, in the classification part. So the segmentation was done on, on image data, and later on we used elevation data to characterize five different types of landslides. Now, in this study, we want to use elevation information for everything. We have nothing else. We have one single layer of data, of LIDAR data. No optical data whatsoever, no multipoles. It's only one, one layer. So that's what we have to work with and pull all the information uh, out of it, okay? So, therefore, our objective is to test if OA or OB or GOBA uh, can be used to, to map landslides using only LIDAR data for both the segmentation as well as the classification. So, we want to focus on extracting sort of these uh, morphological expressions or manifestations of vegetated landslides, which can be very subtle. Um, by trying to identify different parts and then growing landslides, so starting with the scarp, then growing them outwards, essentially. Um, and to, to, to see if also the optimization procedures that MATA, for example, uh, developed, the, the plateau objective function specifically, can also be applied to LIDAR data, and then just try to see what are the pros and cons of doing this, essentially. Uh, we consider this quite relevant uh, because if you have vegetated landslides, there's simply not many options. Optical data will just not get you very far. Um, and yeah, pixel-based work, as I said, has severe limitations. So, a very brief look at our study area in the Flemish Ardennes in Belgium. I suppose Frieke knows this quite well. I've never been there, actually, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm the remote sensing person here, I suppose. But um, it's, it's quite a fascinating area. As I said, it's not commonly associated with a landslide hazard. And when you, when you look at this, uh, it, this is already in a vertically exaggerated image. So, these are really very subdued uh, features in the landscape, which are really not very obvious at all, even if you're standing there. Yeah, and so we have different types as well, so rotational or complex. And this area alone uh, has been affected by more than 200 deep-seated uh, landslides, many of which are old and have been anthropogenically altered. So um, I referred earlier to the study by, by me from 2007 where she had this expert-based uh, inventory, and you see the results here. So uh, quite a clustering, uh, really, of these, of these features, and that we're now trying to find with, with OA independently. So we're not, we're not using this at all as a priori information, only later on uh, to, to validate. So how do we do this? Quite simply, again, we use our, our LIDAR data. We try to see which derivatives would be useful. How would a human being process these data? What kind of reasoning would we go through step by step to see you know, how we would identify uh, these landslides? Then how do we translate this into some kind of like meaningful rules that are actually somehow transferable and somehow objective and not, not entirely uh, location specific? And then to see how, how well we do. So as I said earlier, we have a conceptualization of a, of a landslide that you see here. So we start with the main scarp. And of course, we have all sorts of like faults false positives. So here, for example, number seven, you see these cropland fields, which have similar signatures, sometimes quite, uh, quite rustic terrain changes. Um, but typically, the, the head scarp tends to be quite well uh, identifiable that you can see here. Side scarp is so-so. It can work. It depends very much on the location. But that will be our next line of evidence, growing south, south slope, if you want to, uh, growing our, our landslides, and then hoping to find some kind of evidence of a tow area, which is even harder, because these areas tend to be extremely variable. Sometimes everything has been bulldozed away to make, to make way for a road, or it just ends up in a river or, or somewhere else. So uh, constraining the end of a landslide tends to be rather difficult. So the, the LIDAR data that we had actually uh, were, were much poorer than what Casper just uh, presented. So we had a sort of like, we started with an average pulse rate of only one in four meters square. So very low resolution data actually. And they've been, been pre-processed uh, partly by this company. So in the end, we have only, <coughs> excuse me, one point per 20 square meters, which is really very low evidence base actually when you're looking for small train changes. So I think for Casper it was a, quite a different story working with these fantastic uh, high resolution data. 
Um, vertical accuracy was quite good, however, so ranging from like 7 centimeters to 20 centimeters depending on the land cover. And then we created a 2 meter DTM in, in, in various derivatives in ArcGIS that you can see here. Standard stuff, we heard about this yesterday already as well, uh, slope gradient, uh, relief, uh, plant coverage, roughness, openness, flow direction, etc. So we, 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 we can generate uh, substantial amounts of, of information and our question is uh, how far does it take us to find these, uh, these slides. So again, our ultimate benchmark is human, human perception. If I look at these data, especially in 3D, typically I can find these landslides, but if I have to catalog how I make the decision step by step, it's far harder. Right, to, to make this, this, this translation, which is what's required to teach e-cognition, teach a computer how to do this. Question is, what, what is our basis? Do we use it as this kind of like, like theoretical 3D block diagram as a basis, or do we ask the expert to write down exactly the, the, the decision-making sequence, etc.? So that's, that's the hard part. Um, as I said before, we identified a number of different landslide parts, so the main scarf, flanks, the body, and the foot. And so we, we identify a number of characteristics, which is nothing, nothing really that you don't know. Um, as I said, main scuffs were the easiest. They tend to be steep, uh, uh, semicircular, have a certain length-width ratio, uh, main direction to, uh, with respect to surface flow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you can contrast that with a number of different faults, positive such as earthen banks and so forth. Um, so this is our catalog to start with, ultimately. Okay, then. The first part is then really the segmentation. As I said before, we used this uh, plateau objective function uh, developed by Martha, which worked reasonably well on optical data. For those of you who came to my talk yesterday, I, I showed some positive and also not so positive examples. Here the challenge really is, which of our derivatives do we use? And, and when, you, when, you, when you contrast uh, uh, sort of like a, like a relief image or an openness image, the, the, the scale variation in there is often not very meaningful. And so when you look at these, at these charts here, sometimes you just don't really have any meaningful peaks, for example. It makes it very difficult to pick an appropriate uh, scale parameter. So we experimented with that. And of course, that always leads to, to a reduction transferability because you end up having to some kind of trial and error uh, uh, testing really to identify meaningful scale parameters which is still, uh, still a bit of a problem. Um, for the actual classification, we use support vector machines trying to train our classifier a little bit. Um, again, uh, working on different, on different levels, so having identified what we thought were meaningful scale parameters for these different, different features. Um, again, starting uh, with some general thresholding, what are our possible scarp areas, getting rid of everything else, that tended to be relatively easy. Um, at the second level, trying to identify our principal false positives, yeah, so the cropland fields, uh, things like that. Um, and then uh, having an, an even lower body, a lower, lower scale, at scale factor 13, uh, that we then use to piece together, starting from the scarp, the landslide body. So from the side scarp growing inwards, growing towards the, the toe, as it were. And I'll, I'll illustrate that in a, in, in a moment, okay? So here you see roughly uh, the, the, the sequence uh, of events, if you will. So on the, in, uh, figure A is, is this first cut, trying to identify these drastic changes in slope, which can indicate uh, our main scarp area. Um, then a second uh, multi-scale segmentation with different scale factor. Uh, that we can then use to, to characterize these earths and banks and these other standard uh, uh, false positives that we're that we're dealing with, etc. And you see a, a certain sort of like refinement at these different scales. There is some some merging in there. There's this progressive elimination of false positives going on in there. And so the main message here really is that is illustrated in these bottom three three figures, starting from the scarp essentially looking, looking downslope using our process knowledge to identify features which show a change in terrain on the side which we, can, we, could, we could use as, as potential side scarps and if that makes sense, if they kind of connect 
or even even have small uh, discontinuities, but then continue again that we identify those and then progressively on an individual basis grow these landslides into into full body landslides and then uh, get rid of everything else. That's the that's the idea. I'm not going to show you all the different uh, not, not the rule set for example. Part of it is indicated in the in the paper which you have on your on your on your memory stick, but also there's a paper in, in press that will detail everything for you to look at. Um, if we consider our results, on the left-hand side you see the expert image, so this is the, the, the uh, um, yeah, summary, if you will, of these seven different, different experts, and then this is what we came up with. Again, first observation is, okay, pretty good agreement. Yeah, I think we, we find most, most landslides. Um, some have a different shape. Some have also been missed, uh, and, and we also have a few uh, uh, false positives. So if we look at these, uh, at these numbers, the first thing you notice is that um, when it comes to SCARP identification of deep-seated landslides, I would point you to this number here, 92%, so we do find essentially all the, all the prominent SCARPs. For those that are kind of possible or shallow, things get much more difficult, as you would expect. We only have DM information. If the SCARP is almost not visible, we will not find it. That's clear. Um, Sometimes we kind of grow funny shapes. So in, in B and C, for example, so earths and banks uh, and valley heads have been mistaken for lens. We start growing them, and then we end up with some kind of like crooked uh, figures there. Um, that is still a problem. But when it comes to, to really to deep-seated landslides, finding the scarp, accuracy 92%, finding the scarp, and, and more than 50% of the body, we still get accuracies of over 70%. So I would say when it comes to the identification of that type of deep-seated landslide, yes, we can do it. If you go down from there towards possible landslides, some that are well, maybe there, maybe not, that are shallow, etc., then I guess you need additional information. So we think that uh, as a first try this had work, has worked uh, pretty well. So this combination of plateau objective function support vector machine has given us comparable accuracy rates to, to what Marta found on optical data. Um, the method is really suitable where you have main scarps, um, but depending on your type and the extent and the nature of your false positives, such as field boundaries, valley heads, earthen banks, of course, uh, you will have challenges. Okay? And of course, we're still struggling with some of the limitations of choosing scale parameters and so forth. Um, we're currently busy trying to translate this approach to other areas, such as the Four Arbeck area in Austria, but there it's even more difficult because it's very steep terrain. We have uh, rock outcrops, etc. Um, so we have to see how far we get. But I want to leave you with this, with this nice uh, uh, illustration down here at the bottom of how well we can actually, when it works well, how well we can identify these landslides. So on the right-hand side, this is automatically grown from the image that you see on the left. So um, I think if, you, if you're interested in this, I would again refer you to, the, um, to, this, to this paper. And also our uh, IDC website, the OA group, has more information on this, and we will also put the rules set up there. So, sorry I overran by, by a minute or so, um, but I think we still have time for a quick question or two. Thank you.